who felt that he had to follow young Trayvon Martin, even though young Trayvon Martin was just going home. And, and, and he was acquitted. And it might be part of the mindset of the jury that acquitted Mr. Zimmerman. It's also the same mindset that allows Mayor Bloomberg to say what he did. It's also the same mindset that justifies and rationalizes that we have to conduct a stop and frisk in order to keep people safe. That young people of color must be doing something wrong. If we want to change that mindset once and for all, starting with this forum right here, let's call for the abolition of stop and frisk, which is the biggest form of racial profiling anywhere here in the United States of America. What the mayor has unfortunately decided to do in justifying a policy that can't be justified, at least the indiscriminate or, or the stopping of hundreds of thousands of individuals in the city of New York primarily because of who they are and what they look like um, is really outrageous. And, you know, I was, it continues, the fear mongering and, and the attempt to justify things just continues. Each, I mean, it was after the judge's decision, which I agree with, which a number of New Yorkers and lots of New Yorkers agree with, because people's constitutional rights have been violated. They've been stopped only because of who they are and what they look like. And the fact that he attempts to continue to justify that, I still, I just can't believe it after a certain point. The one thing though, and, and it is part of, and I had spoken about it earlier, and did a speech that talked about, you know, that, that stop and frisk and government in this case, kind of sanctioning or institutional suspicion of individuals just because of who they are and what they look like, because of their color, is wrong. And that's exactly what happened in Florida with Trayvon Martin. He was followed, he was profiled because of who he was and what he looked like. And government can't justify that. And we need to stop that. So there are a number of things that can be done, but the reality is we don't have to sacrifice our civil rights to be able to stay safe. We can do both. Government can accomplish both. There are a number of different ways that it can be done without the violation of people's constitutional and civil rights. And to suggest otherwise is, a, is, the, is for government almost to concede defeat, and that is wrong. Let's take a step back a second. Why is stop and frisk flaring up in New York City? We don't see it flaring up in dozens and dozens of cities across America. What's happening here? It's not happening elsewhere. Let's look at the stats first of all. 2003, 140,000 stops. 2012, 530,000 stops. Why are we using this one tool to the exclusion of everything else? Why has this increased so much? This tool, a throwback from 20, 30 years ago, why don't we just focus on this one thing as our only tool of law enforcement? The fact is we can move beyond this. We can look at new ideas, fresh ideas. Let's take, for example, looking at technology. Other cities, cities as close as cities in Nassau County, Los Angeles, other places around the world, are using newer techniques of policing. We need to encourage our police force to go ahead and do these things. They're using techniques, for example, using big data, looking for patterns. Yes, in New York, back in the 80s and early 90s, we started with CompStat, but we've lost our way. We have to come back to understanding how to get the next generation of pattern recognition so we can do this without stopping and frisking everybody. We can find the patterns, we can locate the assailants, we can locate the problems and the criminal operations without having to stop and frisk every single person in New York City. Let's come back to the community. Where I grew up, near Bensonhurst, Gravesend, Coney Island, we developed a very strong relationship with our police, with our police force. And that is key to having successful New York City. If we continue to use efforts that divide community and police, we're not going to be bringing crime down over the long term. Well, you may get some short-term gains, you're going to have trouble in the long term. The fact is, we have to come back to a deeper sense of community policing. Not just police precincts, not just having some meetings in the police precinct once in a while, but actually going out into the community. We need to bring in 2,000 more police on the force. We've gone from 40,000 down to 34,000, and by the way, 3,000 of those folks of those police officers are not available to work in the community. We have to come back up to speed so that we can be back in the community, engage with the community. Not surveil the community, but engage with the community. That's how we're going to get beyond this issue. Thank you. George McDonald has a different point of view. I do. But I don't know if you can hear me with yes, this microphone. It's on. Um, you know, what I never hear in these forums 
never from anybody, is the mass incarceration of African American men in America. Nobody ever talks about that. But most of the people in the community, the young men, have a, and their fathers, have a real problem. And that's a criminal record. And they can't get a job. And they come home from upstate, and they wind up violating and going back. And the statistics are off of the charts. And the unemployment for African American youth, the unemployment across the city between 18 and 24 year old is 20%. They're unemployed and not going to school. But when you break it down to people of color, you're going to find out that it is an unbelievable statistic. But yet I'm sitting here mostly with elected officials that never talk about it and never talk about anything else other than what Mike Bloomberg and the city of New York have done wrong. They never offer a positive solution to what is this problem that we have? What is the underlying problem that causes this, that causes the crime? that causes the people to be on the street corner in the communities. It's lack of education and lack of employment. Mm -hmm. And if you do an overlay of the census track of poverty, of, of, uh, of the rest of the, the statistics that, that of crime and uh, unemployment, and you just keep on building that map. And they're all the same communities. It's Ocean Hill, Brownsville, it's Mott Haven. There, we know what those communities are. What we need to do is focus on investment for the people in those communities. The rest of it is rhetoric that means nothing. It was an unelected judge and an unelected monitor are going to be in charge of our safety and they're going to demoralize the police department. And I have lived through this before in this city when the police didn't work and it is not pleasant. First of all, the current administration they insist that stop and freeze is a tool uh, to enforce uh, the law and order. But the reality is that they're using stop and frisk as the substitute of the community policing. And they say that we have stop and frisk right now and it's preventing crime, but they're not saying that we're not seeing the, the big cap on the street anymore with the scooter, with the bike, with the horses. When you have a, a, a problem right now in the street, you have to call 911. And, uh, and then hope that they come on time. And uh, we have to go back to the community policing. We have to increase, they're trying to save money. They uh, uh, led the forces to go down to 34,000 police officers. So they have to actually come with an idea where they could save money by not hiding extra police uh, forces and also keep the, the city, what they call, safe. So New York City is not a melting pot anymore. It's very centralized. When you go out on the street and you go to a Spanish community, you see nobody but Spanish. When you go to an African-American community, you see nobody but African-American. So what the mayor is doing is, is taking advantage. That's why they don't do it in Los Angeles, because everybody's mixed in Los Angeles. Over here, everybody's centralized. So they take the zip, different zip code, they send stop and uh, force to those zip code, and I am the one, I'm my children, the one who have the risk to be stopped during that stop and frisk operation. The mayor is very intelligent. He knows that this city is very centralized, and he's using that to use this tactic. And yes, many people say, oh, it is great, because he gives you the statistic. He has something with the statistic. But what he don't tell you is the one that are suffering with this tactic is the Latino community and the African American community. Obviously, if they put all the African American, all the Latino in jail, then they have zero, zero crime. It is unacceptable. This is very discriminatory, and it needs to come to an end. And please make sure that Gary La Prensa said that I am also, with John Lou, believe that stop and freeze has to be abolished. We have to go back to the community uh, policing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bajwani has the next question. Thank you. Uh, so as uh, was mentioned before, I'm Sayu Bajwani, and I founded an organization called the New American Leaders Project, which trains immigrants to run for office across the country. And I also served as Commissioner of Immigrant Affairs under Mayor Bloomberg in uh, 2002. So um, I wanted to start with a, a question that um, addresses, I think that what we have seen over the years that candidates and elected officials have an increasing understanding of the demographics of our city and um, people have gotten very good about you know, saying hello in different languages and marching in all the right parades and knowing the key words that, uh, that make many of us 